So, um, my name is Jason, and uh, I run a company called uh, PEPO, and I run a company called OST, uh, which stands for Open Simple Token. Uh, PEPO is built on OST technology, uh, and uh, I'm going to walk through kind of who we are and why we built this, and then kind of what you can learn from it. Um, so, in the back of the room, we have Simona Pop. Come to the front, Simona. Um, some of you might know Simona. She's world famous. She is our chief engagement officer. She runs a lot of programs around uh, blockchain for good causes, for onboarding new people to the crypto community. Um, she's, what else are you doing this weekend? I am emceeing. I don't know if you saw me. I was like a little bit on stage for yep. a second. So I will return to that stage later on, um, on Sunday. But yes, awesome. we'll see you around the hackathon. And um, so also here from our team, we have, so if you want to find me on Twitter, I'm Betashop, uh, Simona is Simpop. Uh, we have Kevin. Kevin and Paul will be here all weekend, uh, and they're going to be judging uh, the UX awards. Uh, so they'll be uh, kind of evaluating different projects. Um, but so the UX awards. So as I mentioned, uh, technology agnostic. There's 4,000 die in prizes available in the UX awards. The, the top team will win 2,000 die. Two runner-ups will win 1,000 die. Um, and so what I want to go through is what is great UX and how do you win a UX award and why are we making this technology agnostic? Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we are the makers of an app called Peepo. Um, Peepo is built on Ethereum. Uh, we spent four years building technology that enables apps like people to be possible. Um, we have an SDK that enables apps to basically integrate a Ethereum smart contract wallet seamlessly into any application. Now, unfortunately, it's not something that you can do in a weekend, right? Because you need to have an iOS or Android app, um, and they also have certain things they need to do in order to get those apps approved by the app stores. Um, but we are working on enabling white label apps for future hackathons and other things to enable people to hack on those aspects of our technology. Uh, and we're also going to open up other aspects. The SDK is open source, uh, but we'll be having other things hackers can do at these hackathons. But we want to show everyone what's possible when you think through uh, kind of the user experience driving the technology and the two things coming together in tandem. Um, I encourage everyone, though, to download the app on the App Store. Um, the app is basically it's bringing together the crypto community. We launched it at DevCon a few months ago. Um, a third of all DevCon participants in Osaka tried the app. They gave us tons of feedback. We then iterated on it during San Francisco Blockchain Week, during uh, Singapore Blockchain Week last year, then in Waterloo, uh, ETH Waterloo last year. And then we did a whole new relaunch of the app based on the user feedback, based on having an active conversation with hundreds of users, thousands of points of feedback. Uh, we did a relaunch at ETH Denver two weeks ago, and the usage just skyrocketed from there. And what we learned uh, through, the, through the feedback was uh, what you see here is communities. Um, we said so the People app features 30 second videos by people um, with integrated tokens appreciation. So every like actually transfers value. And what we found was people were using the app in the Ethereum community um, very differently from TikTok. TikTok's like fun entertainment. People in Ethereum uh, and crypto were using it like more like professional and business and work and things that are, that are their passions. Uh, and they drove us to say, well, could we organize this into different communities? And so we launched communities last week. Community is crypto's killer app. I think we all know this. Um, but we launched communities last week. We have communities for ETH Denver, for ETH London here this week, for ETH CC next week, uh, for 1 million developers. People are creating communities now on things like foodies, other type of topics, but starting from the crypto community and building out. Um, but I encourage you to download it, not just really just to try it as like an app, because obviously there's lots of video apps out there. But to experience the onboarding, experience the, what, it, what, it, you know, what it's like to uh, download an app, sign up, and within 60 seconds have a smart contract deployed on your behalf, um, to be able to secure that smart contract with just a six-digit pin that you can recover from the smart contract, to be able to have multiple devices that you can connect into the, into the smart contract and access, access your funds. Uh, I'm going to walk you through some of these features, but I think it's really valuable if you're developing on Ethereum to see what's possible if you think through the user experience from smart contract wallet perspective. Um, and so our technology that we built, and I don't want to make this a sales pitch, I just want to give you kind of what's behind this is basically what we've built is this Ethereum application layer, so kind of SDKs to enable you to embed smart contract wallets into any app. And the key thing here is basically we're deploying a series of smart contracts for every single user inside the application. Um, and so, uh, that enables the user experience uh, that, that, um, that, that people provides. And so 
I wanted to kind of dispel this notion that uh, UX is designed. You know, I think often people hear about user experience, they hear about UX, and they think, oh, that's the graphic design team, or that's the, the pixels. Um, UX is not about design. Design is a part of it. But the reality is that UX is about problem solving. It's about really understanding what does the user need, what is their pain point, and how do we build the right product for them. A similar myth is that UX is all about the interface, that UX is all about, like, you know, a lot of people talk about UX, they say it's just about the onboarding, or it's just about how fast people can get through the app. The reality is that the UX is about that unique combination of the story, the architecture, and the implementation. Um, and really, if you think about how do you merge these worlds of, okay, this is the user story, and this is what the user is trying to accomplish, and this is the technology, and how do we bend the technology or mold the technology to get the experience that we want? So the key to all of this is starting with the problem instead of with the solution. Um, and I think all too often in crypto, we sometimes start with the, you know, crypto is a very elegant solution for decentralizing uh, finance or for banking the unbank, and therefore we're going to build this. But we, that's not solving a problem. That's kind of saying, well, do we have a solution in mind. Solving a problem is really thinking through, all right, there are these people and they have this pain point and we've identified it, and so we're going to build this to help them do something easier, better, uh, faster, cheaper, more convenient. Um, and so, just to give you a little perspective on this, backing up four years ago, and when we started this project, the aha that, that we had, we had like, well, everyone is, is increasingly a content creator. Imagine this is 2016, right? Not even TikTok doesn't exist yet. We're looking out at the world and saying, everyone is a content creator. And every single day, we're contributing our content to the platforms, and they get all of our content for free. And they monetize their platforms to build these huge businesses, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, t Twitter, etc. Um, and the problem is, if you're an Instagram influencer, how do you earn more than just likes? Um, if you're, you know, if you're, uh, you know, a top influencer, like when I say one of the Kardashians, yes, you can. But how do, you know, how do any of us just, you know, we're giving away so much content every day? How do we earn more than just likes? And the aha we had was, well, what if every like could actually transfer value? What if you actually could inject the internet of money into applications and have peer-to-peer -peer value transfers with every like? And it doesn't be the like. It could be the five-star review. It could be the upvote, whatever it might be. What if, what if that would be possible? So imagine we're thinking about this in 2016. Well, we then went right to thinking about, what would that user experience have to be? And you know, we're like, well, it can't be this. Um, if you can't read this in the back, basically what this is, um, you go to, let's say, like someone's Instagram photo, and it says, you know, please you know, write down 12 words to set up your wallet um, before proceeding. You know, Instagram users are not going to write down 12 words. Right? We, as early adopters of Ethereum and crypto, we will, because we're you know, willing to suffer through some pain to try to build something. Right? But that's not what mainstream users are going to do. So we, so we have to say, right, how do we solve that problem that the user doesn't have to go through this clumsy experience? Or, you know, let's say using an external wallet, right? Or let's say, oh, you know, because like, let's say, you know, to proceed, let's say, connect MetaMask or whatever. I don't want to pick on MetaMask. It's a great product and great team. But, you know, it's like users are not going to say, I'm going to take a, a lesser experience than I know of today in Instagram just to earn a few cents before I even know what this is. So you can't expect users to, like, you know, exit this app and go into another app in order to proceed. But let's just imagine for a second that our users were willing to do that. And I successfully clicked the like button. And magically, let's say that we figured out a way to have money transferring from one user to the other user. Well, users aren't going to, they're not going to put up with this, where it's like, okay, well, please you know, open up some other app to confirm the transaction or sign the transaction. Oh, and make sure you have some ETH in your wallet in order to do so. What's ETH? Right? That's not going to apply. Um, and you know, obviously, an Instagram user is used to you know, amazingly super fast responsive application. They're not going to put up with, you know, please wait for the block confirmations in order for this ter transaction to, uh, to, be on, you know, to be approved. Um, and then especially this couldn't be, poss you know, couldn't be the experience. And basically, if you can't read this, what it says is, you know, please uh, spend 2.9 cents to send your one cent to Ben. Right? And so you think about what Ethereum layer one gas costs, right? Um, you know, it can be more than this, it can be somewhat less, but this is pretty typical, right? Um, and so back in uh, 2016, I hooked, hooked up with my good friend Ben, who was really early, early in Ethereum. Um, he was lead developer of Hyperledger Burrow, he worked at Monax and MadeSafe, 
and was thinking about these problems for you know, a long time before I was. So I was coming from the Web 2.0 world, thinking about user experience. How do we enable you know, Instagram users to earn more than likes? And I started talking to Ben about, well, how would we go about solving this? And that's like that marriage of like, what do you want the experience to be? And what technology do you need to build in order to make that happen? And I just you know, fell right down the rabbit hole, as, you know, uh, you know, as, as we, I think as we all do, when you think about, OK, the elegance of the possibilities of this technology, and what could, you know, what could we, what, how might we solve this? And think, OK, yeah, so one person could have, you know, we, let's say we had, let's say, the Internet of Information, now we had the Internet of People, go to the Internet of Money, and with any transaction that could be transferring value person to person without going through the platforms, and everyone's controlling their own funds, and like, like wow, how can we make this happen? So, UX-driven thinking is you then turn that into thinking like a solution. And so what we thought through back in 2017 was what if we could deploy the app tokens, let's say the Instagram tokens, or in our case, the Peepo tokens and the app that we've built here. What if we could deploy the app tokens on layer two Ethereum um, so it's faster and cheaper, so that solves some of the problems in terms of speed, in terms of cost, um, but do so with a full EVM running on layer two. So that gives us the smart contract capabilities. Um, and then use the smart contract capabilities to do things such as um, enabling user-friendly recovery. So as, you know, as you'll see in the Peepo app, you can recover a wallet with a six-digit PIN, and yet it's safe and secure because it's the way it's designed through the smart contracts. Um, to enable something called session keys. So session keys, really awesome stuff. Um, basically, for every user in the Peepo app, we deploy a multi-sig. Uh, they have a private key on their device. The so user has full self-custody. Um, their private key on the device interacts with the multi-sig to basically to access the funds in their token holder address. And that multi-sig author also authorizes session keys. And the session key is basically allowed to execute small transactions on the user's behalf. So let's say within a one-week period up to 10 bucks, every like that I do, I don't need to sign the transaction. And meta transactions are employed so the user doesn't need to worry about gas. Right? Um, and so that's how you kind of think through it. So how do you how do you enable these experiences, but also think about UX is also about how do you pull all the technology together. So I just want to show you real quick the result of this. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do a live demo, but I think I can. Let's see. And the live demo I want to show you is less, again, about Peepo being a really cool social app, but more about how do you enable the internet of money to be integrated into any application. So this is Peepo here at ETH London. Um, you'll see there's people who are creating videos. That's me. Cool. Um, Sim, thank you. Uh, uh, so now the cool stuff when it comes to us, you know, technology geeks here, is every time I tap the like button here, think about it. It's like medium claps, except I'm actually sending the other person money. Every one of these uh, claps that I'm doing here, or these likes, is worth one cent. And so if I go out to the blockchain here, You'll see that I sent a few seconds ago 24 peepos to that person, and the cost of that transaction was 0 0.0000011 cents on our layer two chain. Um, because it's not a competitive environment like proof of work, it's a collaborative environment on layer two, on the, on the chains we've set up. Um, and so what you have is super fast transactions, you have users having a full Ethereum wallet inside the application. So this is the smart contract. So the token holder address or where my funds are held, so I can set up multiple devices to access the funds. I have a recovery address to basically initiate recovery from the smart contract with a delayed recovery. Now again, we don't expect anyone here to build this in a weekend, right? But we have an SDK for this. Um, and if you're interested, after the hackathon, if you want to build an app on this, um, we're happy to help you do this and help you think it through. But we wanted to show this as an example of how do you marry kind of design thinking and technology thinking uh, into creating great user experiences. So back to the presentation here. Does someone have a question? I thought I saw someone. Okay. All right. Um, so I can. So. Basically, we had to build all this and continue building it in order to enable an app like that. And then we want to make this not just one app, but make it any app to be able to do it. Um, we can talk through some of the components later if you want to come by and find me. Um, but you know, also it's important we you know we deploy a, multi, a Gnosis multi-sig for every single user, 
Um, and you know, if you're doing that in layer one, that'd be super expensive. In layer two, it's a lot cheaper. Um, and you know, we had to build a, a basically a relayer uh, and also ability to kind of have tokens on uh, layer one Ethereum, or we call value tokens, that has a basically a connection to layer two, um, which are the utility tokens or the app tokens. Uh, and then to be able to anchor this all back in layer one in order to make it actually fully on blockchain. So a lot of hard problems to solve to make these user experiences possible. So I'm going to go past this because I showed this on the live demo. Um, so as you think through how do you curate you know, kind of, you know, great user experiences in crypto, what I wanted to share is what we, we call the five UX essentials um, and kind of, you know, Think about them as like, you know, kind of starters, kind of guidelines to think about, you know, how do you marry the worlds of UX and technology towards building things that people actually need. So the first principle I say is like, you really need to have a use case. Um, you know, don't just build technology for technology's sake. Think about why are you building what you're building and who you're building it for. Um, as I said before, the framework that I like to use, I call it yes, but so and how. Um, and to give you kind of how this works, it's like you kind of just write this down in a sentence and you say, you know, yes, there are these people, let's say, yes, there's these developers um, who need something. They need to be able to code something in a weekend that it normally takes them two weeks to do, right? But there's this problem that stops them from doing it. The technology is too hard for them to work with or there's this thing they can't, they can't get their heads around. So, that, so they're stuck, right? And a lot of what we do is we build things to help people who are stuck get unstuck. And so we built this in order to help them get unstuck or help them solve what the problem they want to solve. And here's how it works. So you can apply this yes but so framework to pretty much any problem that you might build a product around. So to go back to the example that I showed you, with Peepo it, it was like, yes, everyone is a creator. Um, but the large platforms are making all the money. Um, and with everyone being a creator, it's harder and harder for creators to stand out, get noticed, and to connect with people that share their passions. Um, and so we built Peepo, uh, which is an authentic community uh, driven social platform to solve this problem. Um, and how do we do it? Well, we combine 30 second videos, every like earning money, tokens using to help the signal noise problems. Now, you notice I didn't mention the word blockchain crypto Ethereum once here. Because even though this is, this is the how, like it's part of this every like earns a token, um, and tokens are used to, to kind of help solve this signal noise problem. The fact that it's built on Ethereum or built in crypto or blockchain is an enabler or enabler of that, right? And it's not, you know, it's like you think it's the, it's the ingredients that made these experiences possible, but that's not what solves, like the fact that we built on Ethereum doesn't solve the user's problem to the user. What solves the user's problem is that they want to get something done, you know, faster um, or better or more convenient or whatever the, the problem you might be solving. So how do you go about doing that? So the key, from our perspective, is really understanding user motivations. Another thing about it is know the pain point. Right? You need to really understand what is the hot button that's going to get users uh, to switch to your product. And the way I like to put it is that no matter what you're building, your target user is switching from something. Um, and it could be that they're switching from not knowing they even have a problem, or not knowing that, or maybe switching from uh, complacency, or it could be switching from the Web 2 world to the Web 3 world. But everyone switches from something. They, they're, they're doing something today that occupies their time, and they need to give a little bit of their time to you. Or the thing about, like, say, in the App Store, there's a billion apps, and most people use only seven to 10 apps on their phone. If you want to become one of those seven to 10, likely something else drops out of some, someone's day. Right? And so the thing is, how do, you, how do you occupy the space in someone's life that was occupied by something else before? So if you're building a developer tool, for instance, there's lots of tools that developers can use to do lots of things, and they have to think, okay, I'm going to use this one, and I'm going to dig to it, and stop using something else most likely. Because most people don't just keep layering, 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 adding tools. At some point, something falls out. Um, and so you think about, let's say, if you use GitHub today, you use something else before. If you use Jira today or Notion, you use something else before. There's always something that drops when something else is kind of adopted. Um, so, the way to kind of figure this out, and I know you don't have time to do this necessarily in a, in a hackathon weekend, although you have you know, a couple hundred other hackers you can talk to, and kind of, is really to talk to people. And talk to people means 
listen to them and find out what their needs are and try to find something that people actually need. And this is why I really implore you to try, to try to build something, whether it's here this weekend or just in general when you go back home and work on your, on your products or your, your, your jobs, try to build stuff that people need. And the way you know people need it is that they tell you they need it. Um, it's not just our hunch or hypothesis that they need it. It's actually hearing from them that they need it, that they have, the, that they have a pain point. And I'll say, a real quick, you know, as someone who's been an old guy, he's been working in building products as a product manager for you know, 25 years now. Uh, there was a time, I think about 15 years ago, where I think if you were just really smart, you could build something without talking to users. Um, I felt like you know, it was basically before the app store, before you know, a billion apps, and if anyone could build, a, you know, build an app in you know, a week, that you could basically just put up a website, and if you were a first mover, you could build something and find a niche. I mean, I had a company, a social media, that we had six million users within three months. You can't do that anymore. It just doesn't happen anymore. There's just too much competition. Um, but, you know, but now you have to, you, hunches alone are not enough today. Now you have to talk to users, have to talk to who might be the customers of your app before you build something. Um, if you want to go deep and kind of learn a little bit about this, we, we have basically these three principles for kind of how you talk to users, how you do conduct user interviews and make the information uh, usable. We call them basically you build a foundation, you get participation from everyone on your team, and then you go through a prioritization exercise. And just really quickly, the foundation is basically understanding like, the difference between discovery um, and uh, kind of hypothesis, experimenting or hypothesis testing, and then turning that into something that actually is actionable. So discovery is basically when you're just talking to people and hearing what they say, and then you then build hypotheses around that and put experiments in front of people, and then you do hypotheses and tests. And having kind of a framework to kind of go step by step to test this is super important. Participation is just, you know, a lot of people, as I said at the beginning, they think UX, they think, oh, that's the design team or that's the product team. Um, at our company, I implore you and your project as well, everyone does interviews, everyone listens, participates in interviews. We kind of say that, Understanding and hearing the needs of the customer is everyone's job. Um, and especially because you know, what I've found in my career is that depending on your background and what your job function is, everyone hears differently. Um, an, engineer, an engineer will hear the same conversation as a product manager, as UX designer, as a CFO, as you know, some, a business development person. They'll hear the same exact conversation differently. And they'll all bring in very important input into it. So having the whole team participate in user research is really, really important. Um, and then ultimately, obviously, you got to turn that into prioritization, which is in some ways one of the hardest parts because you got to take still all this information and learning that you have from doing user research and interviews and kind of say, all right, what are the themes and which are the ones that we think are actually actionable and turn that into uh, a roadmap. Um, and one way we do that is we, we tag things. Um, and so we use tools like Dovetail, for instance, to tag things. And then we kind of go into kind of um, diving into what are the most common themes that we heard. So, do you want to do it, Simona? Up to you. Up to you. <laughs> let's do it. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. let's, let's tag team. Oh, shit. Okay. The third principle. Hello. User, it does, there's no microphone. It's actually just for the No, camera. I know, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. So, empowerment. Does the solution expand the market, further overall adoption, and onboard new users? As you guys know, um, if some of you I've seen this morning in the beginner workshop, it is all about how do you get more people in to that application? How do you essentially solve a problem for more people, not just the people who are literally with you here now? Because this has been one of the issues, for instance, that we've seen at hackathons, people develop either for themselves or to you know, do a fun weekend project or show off to their peers. Let's start getting into this mindset of building for a problem to solve something for actual people. And I think that's a big, big takeaway that I'm hoping I'm going to see throughout 2020 across all the hackathons, across all of the UX awards that we're going to do um, at these global hackathons is how do we get all of these um, towards frictionless onboarding? Let's think about new ways rather than getting people to, you know, download a Web3 wallet, then move here, then do this, like Jason showed you earlier. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm going to call you back in a second. Okay. So, you know, one of the cool things actually, you know, being in this space for several years is actually seeing how this has evolved with every, every year and every, every progressive hackathon. Um, and I think, as Simone was saying, that 2020 is the year where we 
you know, think about two years ago, the experience was very, very limited and very, very dev focused. And then, you know, over, especially in the last 12 months, we've seen a big acceleration uh, in things like onboarding experience and things like interactions, things like smart contract wallets. 2020 would be a big year for kind of how we pull this together. And so when it comes to evaluating hackathon projects in 2020, um, you know, there's certain expectations now that, they, that we're not going to have users go through super clumsy onboarding experiences, super clumsy interaction experiences, that some of this stuff just is going to get progressively better and better and better. Um, and then there is this notion at the bottom here, surprise and delight. And I would say that, you know, one of the best things, and I know this seems very hard to, as, from where we're at as, de, you know, as developing projects, is, but one of, the, one of the best things that you know, someone can tell us is, wait, this is really crypto? Um, and when you hear that, it's like, okay, now, now like, we've gotten to them where they're not thinking about the crypto, they're thinking about the actual application or, the, or what they're trying to get done, uh, and the crypto is that enabler that we talked about. So the fourth is innovation. I think this goes without saying that you know, great UX also introduces technology uh, that helps us leap past kind of the, the current state. Hopefully it expo you know, kind of presents a step function, kind of something that kind of accelerates. It could be make some, you know, accelerating, some, making something more convenient or, or easier. Let's say you take something that used to take a developer two weeks to do and you make it you know, two lines of code in you know, you know, an hour, right? That's a huge innovation uh, and that's a huge impact on user experience. Fifth and last. Um, responsibility. So, especially in the crypto community, we think responsibility is a critical part of UX. Um, three things here, I'll just go through it. So, one is, so first of all, does the solution that you're developing contribute to the common good? And you might think, well, I'm not building a, you know, a project for charity or I'm not building something that is, you know, let's say directly contributing to the common good where it's, you know, for good causes. But just building something and putting it out there into the world has a huge impact if you do it the right way. And what I mean by that is if you basically show others how they can use it. So you provide developer tools for other people to be able to adopt your solution and then hopefully open source as much of the technology as possible um, so that anyone can just take your technology and build on it. Now open source is something where just open sourcing something, FYI, does not mean people are going to use it. So creating some developer tools on top of it is really helpful so then developers don't have to build it all from, from scratch. So you know, one of the things that I've heard progressively at various hackathons is we still have this problem of, yes, there's a protocol here, a thing here, a thing here, a thing here, but I have to cobble all that together in my unique way. What I need is some more like just stuff I can just start with, the foundation, and then just build from there. And that's really cool if people can start building more and more things like that. So, as I said, five UX essentials that you're thinking about your product, thinking about your hackathon, thinking about kind of, um, you know, the UX awards. You know, make sure you have a use case. Make sure you show a keen understanding of user needs. Uh, think about how are you empowering users with new onboarding and other ways to uh, make the experience better. Um, how are you, are you introducing a new technology uh, to innovate and make things more convenient and easier? Um, and then how are you showing responsibility towards the common good in what you're developing? So let's wrap up. Um, we have 80 of these hoodies, limited edition. Uh, we made some for ETH Denver a couple weeks ago and they went super fast. Um, the only way to get these hoodies is to earn 2,000 Peepo coins in the Peepo app. When you earn your 2,000 Peepo coins, where's Paul? Paul? You go to Paul and you can basically buy using the app. You can buy, you can buy, the, the, uh, you can buy the, uh, the hoodie with your Peepo coins. Now, you don't need to make a million videos in order to earn 2,000 people coins this weekend. We have six challenges that you go to the people table. Paul and Kevin will show you the challenges. Very simple. Do like a Hell Well World video. Do a video with you, kind of a, a social, so like so introducing you know, someone for the first time that you meet here. There's one challenge specifically around 1 million devs. So what's your idea for how do we onboard more developers for Ethereum? You do three or four of the challenges, you can buy a hoodie. The hoodies are cool. They have this little Ethereum insignia on them, so they're a real collector's item. Um, awesome. Uh, and then just to remind you, UX awards, 4,000 die-in prizes, 2,000 for the best UX, 1,000 for each of the, uh, uh, the runner-ups. Uh, at ETH Denver two weeks ago, 27 of the 75 teams uh, applied for the UX awards. So we encourage you, if you are submitting for UX awards, submit early, get a hold of our team. There'll be a type form you'll need to fill out. Um, it's very simple, but we want to make sure you get time with our team so that our team knows to spend time with you. You'll have seven minutes max to present your project to our team. Um, and then finally, we encourage you to join the community.